brains, you know that? I'll tell you, they, they really can. Do you know that, that Herb, I'm just going to ask you a question you may or may not uh, be aware of. Do you know that, that, uh, that in my family, I'm talking about my antecedents here, in my family, that uh, it is a well-known established fact that I would have been at least three to six inches taller if at a very crucial period in my life I didn't take to wearing a set of seven and a half pound Brandeis earphones on the top of my head almost continually during the growing period of the stripling youth. Uh, well, you, you know what those Brandeis earphones were, you know, the great big things, they look like uh, big aluminum pots on the side of your head. Well, if you start wearing earphones when you're seven years old, when you're walking around playing second base and everything else, you got your earphones on, you're not going to go. <laughs> you're not going to grow to your full height. <laughs> and and uh, more than that, uh, it kind of scrambles your head too, you know, with the earphones going all the time. You know, it got to be so bad at that time. I was listening to a lot of code on my earphones, and uh, I would plug in my earphones into my uh, shortwave radio, and I would listen to code uh, constantly. It got to the point that even when my radio was turned off and my earphones were on the dresser, uh, on top of the uh, dresser there where I kept my feelers mitt and all that stuff, and I was sound asleep in bed, I was still hearing code. I would, <laughs> I would hear code 24 hours a day. Did you ever go through that problem? Yes. It, uh, and uh, even to this day sometimes, uh, I'll be walking along 6th Avenue maybe or up around Lexington, and there's a big traffic jam, and I'll hear uh, horns start to blow, and invariably I start reading stuff into them. And I don't like what I hear quite often. I really don't. Uh, you know, it's pretty sickening. I do a little thing. Oh, well, uh, speaking of uh, that which is sickening, tonight is uh, Salute to Crime Night. And uh, for those of you who uh, have just uh, inadvertently tuned in, I'd like to suggest to you that if you don't like the concept of crime as a concept, we'd suggest you tune out. I think all of us have been at one time or another, guilty of one kind of crime or another. You know, crime is in the eye of the beholder, and that we would like to salute two remarkably inefficient criminals, in fact, three, in Loma Linda, California. Two teenage boys and a 30-year-old woman were the unluckiest burglars that San Bernardino County Sheriff's deputy said they could remember in a long time. Cheryl Jamin and the boys burglarized six homes before dawn yesterday. And we're winding up their night's work with a carload of stereo sets, weapons, auto parts, cash, and other goodies when their car ran out of gas, deputies said. Well, that ain't all. Wait till you hear the rest of it. Then is when the action began. Would you please give me a little of that action music, Herbert, please? <laughs> then it began. While trying to steal another car, they made so much noise that they woke the owner who chased them off with a shotgun. Then, while fleeing from the car, Miss Heyman fell heavily, breaking her ankle. And the two boys carried her, struggling down the street, trying to hide. They ducked into a tool shed, where the boys tried to steal another car, reaching into an open wing window to release the door catch. And what they did not see was a gigantic Doberman pincer asleep on the front seat. But the dog saw them and rawr, 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 got a hold of one of those guys right by the ankle. The young burglar screamed, but the dog held on. The screams drew the attention of the car owner who had chased them earlier. He whipped out a shotgun again and took a great big wide buckshot blast at him. The police then came to rescue the burglars. From the Doberman pincer, the guy with the shotgun, Miss Heyman's foot dragging in the snow, it was one hell of a night. <laughs> well, pick it up, pick it up, let's go. Oh, my God. Hello there. Thank you. Thank you, Herb. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I like that idea of the Doberman pincer laying there, reaching into the wing window. Can't you see it's dark and the guy reaches in there? I don't know whether you have seen a Doberman pincer doing his thing. Well, a Doberman pincer doing his thing makes your average hyena look like a kind of kindly house pet. <laughs> Oh, regardless of how many other Washington's birthday sales you go to this weekend, get to Jay Homestock. Because our Washington's birthday sale will be different. No gimmicks and no promises we can't keep. What we will have are a lot of very good savings. 
like 10 to 50% off on our finest quality living room, dining room, bedroom, and occasional furniture. Entire room settings and special one-of-a-kind pieces in contemporary early American and traditional styles. On oak and glass cocktail tables, cotton print sofas, rush seat occasional chairs, bedding, and more. All at 10 to 50% off. So before you go to any other sale this weekend, get to Jay Homestock. And get here early because even our quantities are limited. 10 to 50% off. This is the one Washington's birthday sale you won't want to miss. Jay Homestock, next to Roosevelt Field, Long Island, and Route 17, Paramus. Sale Saturday through Monday. Long Island store opens Sunday, noon to 6. It's George's birthday again, but this time Lafayette is celebrating in a different way. Instead of slightly reducing prices on just a few items, Lafayette has incredible reductions in every department, some as large as 63%. You'll save $40 on a 40-channel CB package. You'll find LED watches for under $20. You'll save over 60% on a Lafayette stereo amplifier. Lafayette also has a complete LR2020 stereo system for the price of the receiver alone and an entire 40-channel CB outfit for the price of the HB640 alone. You'll also find big buys on calculators and TV games, as well as substantial savings on scanners and car stereo. And as a special bonus, a lantern flashlight will be yours absolutely free, just for visiting Lafayette during this sale. It's Lafayette's George Washington birthday sale, with up to 63% savings, a flashlight free for the asking, and more starting this Sunday at the Lafayette store nearest you. Be there. Well, what have we here? Ah, the Miramar restaurant. The Miramar is conveniently located close to the theater district at 10 East 46th Street between 5th and Madison. This charming, comfortable, friendly restaurant serves the best in continental and Italian foods with exemplary service. So you ask your host, Dominic, for his specialties. Well, what are they? Well, shrimp scampi. Fettuccine Alfredo, or Veal Piccata. Uh, to make your evening even more enjoyable, you can park free. So have dinner at the Miramar. See a show or movie or go shopping, and the Miramar will park your car free for the evening. The Miramar is open Monday through Friday for lunch or dinner and accepts all major credit cards. Call the Miramar for a reservation at area 212 MU7-1096. That's MU7-1096. Television affects everybody, even those who don't watch it. That's why the current issue of TV Guide magazine is presenting a three-part report on the state of television. Part one looks at television news and how it works. It's important and informative reading. The same issue explains what Senator Sam Irvin, Stevie Wonder, and Arthur Rubenstein have in common. They've all been nominated for the top accolade in the recording industry, the Grammy. Read about the history behind this prestigious award. This week's cover story profiles Nancy Walker, who has a splendid disdain for the world of fact and logic. She's a clown, and like all clowns, she's constantly stubbing her toes against the real world. Read about the serious side of a funny lady this week in TV Guide, America's biggest selling magazine, on sale everywhere. I've been dreaming of the magic of the Berkshire Hills today And I know I'll be going back again The next time you're ready for skiing, ski midweek at Butternut Basin. It's only two and a half hours away from the metropolitan area. You'll find everything that's good about New England skiing at Butternut Basin in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. The Berkshires. Ski Magazine gave its top environmental award to Butternut. It was no accident. There's no better combination of concern for the environment and first-rate skiing anywhere. Midweek at Butternut is a special time. You set the pace. No lift lines. For beginners, midweek is a great time for lessons. You may even find a free wine and cheese party in the base lodge. Almost all of Butternut's slopes and trails are served by snowmaking gear. Midweek at Butternut, a special time and a special place for the pleasure of New England skiing. I've been dreaming of the magic of the Berkshire Hills today, and I know I'm going back again. Well, old buddy, if you live in uh, Hicksville or Plainview or beautiful Syosset, uh, is East Meadow, Leventown, Uniondale, or Hempstead uh, where you hang your old hat? <laughs> 
Well, then why don't you look for the special Mid-Island Shopping Center tabloid section in Wednesday's Long Island Press with hundreds of Lincoln's birthday values. Remember, the Long Island Press is still only a dime, a thin dime, at newsstands or home delivered if you call IV61234. IV61234. Do it now. You know, uh, while you're on the subject of, uh, of crime, uh, whenever I read about the criminal having a terrible, terrible time, uh, you know, when everything falls down like the Doberman pincher grabs him by the neck and starts shaking him like a dishcloth and uh, barking and yelling and guys are shooting shotguns at him and everything else is going, you know, just going all the dilly be donged. I, uh, I am reminded, and, I, and I'm waiting, debating really here in my mind whether to tell you the story of, a, of how I learned that the criminal's lot cannot be an easy one. It's not always an easy one. And uh, I, I presume, though, that many of you have never strayed from paths of righteousness. I, now, take you, Herb. I can't see you straying at any point. Well, not really stray. Not really. Oh, no. I, 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 uh, I had an experience one time in the life of the underworld and the world of, uh, of subversive activities that I have never forgotten. It taught me a lesson, man, that I have not uh, cast aside. And uh, whenever I have a brief uh, fit of temptation, and then let's face it, we're all tempted from time to time. Oh, yes. Let's face it. Uh, temptation is always coming across our path. Now, one man's temptation is uh, another man's bore, but I will concede the temptation is always there. And uh, whenever I am tempted, I remember what happened to me the night that Schwartz talked me into crime. And I'm not, this is not fiction, this is a true story. <laughs> and don't anyone ever mention it back out around certain quarters out there. As a matter of fact, it's one of those things which uh, was a uh, deep-held uh, secret between me and my kid brother, and that's about all. It never got back to the top heads in the family. No way. What actually transpired on that desperate night. And uh, you know that there's an old, uh, there's an old idea that uh, criminals always want to return to the scene of where they did it. I don't know whether this is true or not. I, uh, you know, but I will say this: that there is a, uh, a belief that criminals always have a deep-seated desire at one time or another to confess that they did it, because you know when you've pulled a crime, when you've really pulled a goodie, uh, and nobody knows about it, you feel like you know it's, it's like winning a football game, and they didn't put the score in a paper. Uh, <laughs> you know, you want you want people to know you did it. <laughs> And uh, and I I uh, must say that that I I know what that that's about. You know, you've heard of Raskolnikov. You haven't. Well, you have heard of Crime and Punishment. Well, Raskolnikov is the star of it, and uh, he was played by Peter Lorre in the movie. And uh, Peter Lorre always had a guilty look in his eye, anyway. And uh, yes, he did. And I, I remember one time I talked to Peter Lorre. About that, I said, uh, Mr. Laurie, I said, uh, no, no, I just happened to meet him at a party once. And I said, Peter Laurie, I thought you were great in crime and punishment. He said, oh, so, yes. And I said, that was very, very good. He said, only playing myself. And uh, that's quite true, he was. <laughs> I do not a bad Peter Laurie, do I? Uh, he, uh, he also said another thing. I said, hey, uh, the one picture I really thought you were great in was M. Oh, you are discriminating. I said, yes, that's true. That's very true. I am discriminating. I discriminate all the time, and it never makes friends. But uh, while I'm on the subject of crime, I might as well tell you how I got involved in it. Uh, I'm sitting around. It was in school, see. And uh, I think it's very important to have your first experience in crime when you're at a, an impressionable age, because once you learn it does not pay, you may not try it again. If you have your first experience at crime, let's say, and you're in your mid-40s, you're liable to wind up before a congressional committee testifying. Did you know that, uh, did you know that there was a headline recently in one of the uh, trade journals that read, and I will quote it, uh, it said, uh, Watergate celebs sought after by major record firms to ink pacts. <laughs> Watergate celebs. How do you like that? Watergate celebs. 
And that brought up all kinds of thoughts, uh, what, what uh, kind of records they would make. Uh, for example, I could just see, uh, uh, just an idea here. Would you please give me just one moment here? I'll get my equipment out here. I just think what kind of LPs they'd make. Uh, how about this one? Uh, please bring me an idea. Here we go. Yes, uh, John Ehrlichman plays Real Great Shoes Hard. Brought to you in four-track stereo of recording. Direct from the halls of the Watergate hearings themselves. <laughs> Hold it there, thank you. All across the country, business flyers have been impressed with TWA's on-time arrival record. And superior on-time performance is the whole idea behind our baggage operations, too. Listen to Sal Teramina, TWA Ramp Serviceman. We're out to deliver your baggage faster than any other airline. And nine times out of ten, we beat our own tough standards. At TWA, we really hustle. TWA was the first to introduce double baggage containers. And they enable our men to unload the big wide-body 747s and 1011s faster than ever before. Look at it this way. What's the good of having your plane arrive on time if you get stuck waiting for your bags? That's why we're out to move your bags on time, every time. To TWA, being the best isn't everything. It's the only thing. Next time business takes you to St. Louis, take TWA and experience TWA's on-time service. TWA offers more non-stop service to St. Louis than any other airline. Console, Here we are at Corner Distributors at 2901 White Plains Road in the Bronx with Professor Irwin Corey, the world's foremost authority. What was the question? I haven't asked it yet. That's a very good point. Can you tell us something about Sony radios at Corner Distributors? What can I say about Sony radios? That it has come back for large. They got one, 16 bands, two trios, and four quartets. The elucidation and the clarity which can only be incumbent upon this device has made Sony not only a name to conjure with, but the Sony Betamaxes at the corners, the Sony stereo receivers, the Sony TVs. You can get Stony at Sony. Also at our main store, small appliances, jewelry, gold, diamonds, fine china, major appliances, stereo, juvenile furniture, camera, watches, also a carpet store, furniture store, and Toyland. You owe it to yourself to come to Corner Distributors and compare our low, low prices. Corner Distributors at 2901 White Plains Road in the Bronx. If you've never been backstage, then treat yourself to New York's most theatrical restaurant. I'm Ted Hook, your host, and it's showtime every day at lunch, cocktails, dinner, and supper. Our menu is extensive, and reservations are encouraged and honored. Please telephone 581 8447. That's 581 8447. And follow the stars to 318 West 45th Street. Backstage. Come fall in love with a princess. They're like three beautiful sisters. Maybe it was the dazzling Bahamas sun and the warm, transparent waters. But when golfer Johnny Miller went to the Bahamas, he fell in love with not one, but three princesses. The Bahamas Princess Hotel, the Xanadu Princess Hotel, and the Bahamas Princess Tower. They've really got something for everybody. Great golf, sailing, nightclubs, and a fantastic gambling casino. See your travel agent about our Bahamas vacation packages. He'll help you decide which princess to fall in love with. I'm falling in love with a princess. Two furs, that's the biggest bargain in town when it's a two for one vitamin sale at Genovese drugstores. Two for one, that means you buy one bottle of Genovese brand low price discount vitamins and get another just like it absolutely free. Two-for-one vitamin sale happens only twice a year, and it's going on now at all 45 Genovese drugstores. Save on vitamin formulas identical to national brands costing much, much more. Save on natural vitamins, children's chewable, and super savings like these. Multiple vitamins with minerals, 100 tablets, regularly $1.29, now two for $1.29. Vitamin E, 200 international units, 100 capsules, regularly $3.49, now two for $3.49. 
and stock up on natural vitamin C rose hips. 100 milligrams, bottle of 100 tablets, regularly $1.29, now two for $1.29. But hurry, sale ends Saturday at Genovese, the pharmacy store, and so much more. Every year, across America, second, third, fourth generation Americans live vicariously as people from other nations. In New York's Little Italy, people celebrate the Feast of San Gennaro, much as they would in Naples. In the fall, Oktoberfests are held, much as they are in Munich. Every February, the Chinese New Year is celebrated on the West Coast, in the Midwest, in the East, much as it's done in the Far East. At Easter, Polish people prepare the same foods prepared in Warsaw. At Christmas, Scandinavians make grud, the same as in the old country. Our point, only this, an invitation to come with us, Pan Am, to the places where those customs originated. Every American has two heritages. Let us help you discover the other one. Pan Am has daily non-stop 747 service to Rome. Call your travel agent or Pan Am. One of the greatest ideas for a single LP would just simply be entitled John Dean Sings. Now, don't be such a fool as... What do you mean? Sing what? <laughs> don't you understand what that's... That, do, you, do I have to explain the joke to you? No. Do, you, do I have to explain it to you here? No. Okay. okay. You realize, of course, that the underworld uh, term for turning state's evidence and yapping your, your damn fool head off is called singing, right? Oh, oh, what the... Hello, test. Hello, test. Well, now, I, I'll have to get on with the, the story of my criminal career. I was in eighth grade. It's a dangerous point. You're already getting to have that little swagger because you're the oldest, you know, you're the oldest class in grade school. And uh, you're, you're a pretty big kid. You can run a lot. And it was a nice kind of spring afternoon. And I'm coming home from school with Schwartz and Flick, and we had been debating off and on for about the last two weeks whether we ought to build a shack. You ever build a shack when you were a kid? I don't know whether many girls build shacks. I don't know. But I do know that almost every male type has at one time or another either built a shack or taken part in building a shack or been around where one was built. So we are coming home from school. And uh, we decided we were going to build a house. We are going to build a shack. And it was upon that simple premise that our entire <laughs> criminal career began to take place and blossom. So we, we were discussing how we were going to build it. Now, there were several ways that were discussed. One way was to simply dig a hole in the ground and make a cave. That kind of a place. And uh, cover it over with uh, boards. And on top of the boards, you put pieces of tin, like old uh, Pepsi-Cola signs. And then you uh, put sod on top of that, and you got yourself a cave, right? Well, we decided to build an actual shack. We're going to build a shack. Now, where were we going to build it? Well, we were going to build it in a vacant lot next to Flick's house. Now, this vacant lot had a lot of trees in it. It was kind of a, kind of a little uh, dip in it, like a, an old dried-up creek was down there. And it was really secluded, but it had trees. So we decided that's where we are going to build this place, and we were talking about it. And on the way home, coming down the alley, we walked past a large series of vacant lots where there was a group of builders building houses. Now, <laughs> I don't have to tell you what they build houses out of. Well, first of all, they have a lot of great things called two-by-fours. When I was a kid, a two-by-four was a very desirable object to have. In fact, even to this day, I like the sight of a good two-by-four. Don't you, Herb? Beautiful two-by-four. I also like the sight of a keg of, uh, of nails. Somehow, that's something. It's a soul-satisfying experience to see a brand-new keg of shiny nails. I like the smell of a, of a fresh package, great big package. You've seen them, they come packed in, in, uh, in uh, heavy wrapping paper. Do you like the smell of a, of a nice fresh package of uh, asphalt shingles? It's 
kind of a nice smell, it is. And I want to say this, I have to tell you that I personally believe in the devil. I personally believe that the devil puts these things on earth and puts them in plain view so that many people will be drawn from the path of righteousness. I must quote once again Flip Wilson. Something got in us. We were normally law-abiding types, but you smell those fantastic, delicious, fresh, untrammeled, just lovely asphalt shingles. You smell those two-by-fours, and you see those nails, and, that, oh, the mind boggles at what you can do with them. Well, we were walking home, and here were all these workers, and, and they had about four houses that were already up in framework form. You know, they had the, the like the, the big joists and the stanchions up, and they were already, they, they had the, the, the peak roofs on, and uh, you could see where they had poured the concrete uh, down, in the, down in the foundation. And all around these buildings, there were piles of sand, you know, where they had dug up the, the ground there to make the uh, foundations. And <laughs> these buildings were all standing up there, and all around the buildings were piles of materials which were not yet touched, like a uh, whole two-by-fours, big stack of them. And they were about 10 feet long. They were beautiful two-by-fours. They had canvas they'd thrown over them, keep them dry, see. And there were big piles of packages of these magnificent light gray and red, they had little red stones in them, light gray and red asphalt shingles, piles of them wrapped in brown oil paper with, uh, with metal bands around them. You could smell it. They had kegs of nails. And these guys were all climbing up and down on ladders and pounding his stuff, and were walking down the alley. And of course, the alley was filled with all kinds of waste stuff, which they had thrown out, you know, from building the houses. There were all kinds of bent nails and pieces of two-by-four that were cut off at the end and piles of sawdust and junk. And we smelled this. We smelled the sawdust. We smelled the nails. And I could hear somewhere in the weeds the flick of the devil's fork and tail. You could hear it. It goes like that. And you could smell brimstone. And you know, brimstone can be a sexual smell. You smell the brimstone. We walked past where they were building. You could hear the sound of hammering. You know, that's a spring sound in certain parts of the country. The distant sound of hammering goes like that. That's the way a, a good, uh, a good uh, carpenter sounds. He goes... It, it, it rises like that. It has a rising tone. And then you could hear him saw, and you'd hear this... <laughs> 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 oh, yes, indeed. Indeed, indeed. Those are the sounds that can bring you down into the deadly pit of crime and evil. Well, we walked past this place and saw these things, and we were about a block and a half past when the first suggestion was made. Flick said this. Do you think that they would mind if uh, we came back after they were through working and picked up all the bent nails that were on the ground and the pieces of uh, two-by-four which they just cut off to throw away, huh? And Schwartz says, I don't suppose they'd mind if we took some of the broken shingles that are laying around because they broke some shingles there. And we'll just, you know, pick up some of the stuff they're throwing away. Not a bad idea. And so, about an hour later, just as it's getting dark, this little band of scavengers appeared back on the plot where they were building the buildings. And we began to pick up bent nails. That was the beginning. We picked up bent nails, and at first we were very honest and law-abiding. We picked up nothing but old butt ends of uh, two-by-fours, maybe, you know, six, seven inches, eight inches, maybe a foot and a half long. Uh, we picked up broken asphalt shingles. We picked up all kinds of busted pieces of wood, a nice big piece of split plywood, and we're carting this back to the vacant lot outside of Flick's place. Well, now we got a nice pile of, uh, of what looks like waste material. Unfortunately, the next day was Saturday. 
Do you know what happens on Saturday? Well, first of all, not many carpenters work. But kids don't work either. And kids have a strange unrest on Saturday. And so on that Saturday afternoon, we began to build on our house. <laughs> we started to put up the... We had, we had uh, gotten a couple of old clothes poles and we're hammering away. And we brought, we brought out the, the bent nails. And we were pounding on bricks. We had old pieces of brick. And we had a hammers. And we were trying to straighten the nails. Have you ever tried to straighten nails all afternoon? It gets to be pretty irritating. When you know, not more than two blocks away, there are at least 25 kegs of brand new fantastic nails ranging all the way from five penny to ten penny eleven penny brads all kinds of nails well without saying a thing we just drifted on back down towards that place and it was now getting dark and we began to pick up stuff this time we were picking up the real thing schwartz and flick had about five two by fours between them on their shoulders I had about seven bags of nails running around getting various sizes out of the kegs. Bruder had two packages of asphalt shingles, one in each hand, and we ran like hell for the vacant lot, put the stuff in a pile under a bunch of leaves, came back, and proceeded to do this about seven times. Well, by, I'd say, seven o'clock that night, we had enough stuff hidden in the weeds to build maybe a seven-room house. In fact, we even got so brazen that Schwartz suggested that we steal the concrete mixer. <laughs> well, <laughs> all that weekend, we built on our place. We cut up the two-by-fours we began to build. Well, comes Monday, and uh, we're, we're back in school. Everything's under control, and we're really excited because we're building on our house. But now we begin to have a grandiose concept. This is what crime does to you. Crime to never lets you stop. Have you ever wondered why some guy doesn't simply go in and rob a bank for $47,000, quit, open up a McDonald's someplace, and go straight? No. Once you start it, it sucks you in. The excitement. Uh, what is it? Is it the, it's the devil. And so Monday night, we're right back there at the same old stand picking up nails, and we take another, another package of asphalt shingles. Monday night, we come back for the second trip, and as we came back for the second trip... As we come whipping back, suddenly around the corner comes a black and white car with red lights. Red lights on it. And we started to run down the street. Crazy. No, no, that'll do it. That'll do it, Herb. Bring it on. Come on. We start to run down the street. My God, George! Well, we took off down the alley, trailing asphalt shingles. Schwartz running like hell, me right behind him. Bruner trailing off to one side and flick, <laughs> dripping nails like a dog dripping fleas. Well, I want to tell you this. I, I Have you ever run until your absolute, your guts are coming right out of your ears? Have you, uh, can, can you remember any time in your life when you have been running? Whatever these guys were doing, we, we were running up and down alleys and they would, they would hit us off. A, a black and white, you know, these are black and white squad car, would appear at the other end of, of an alley. We would turn and run. We ran and ran and ran. We ran about four straight hours. And as we ran, we kept going westward across town. I don't know what the hell these guys were doing. They must have had some giant net out for us. I mean, I can just see an APB. Uh, <laughs> the ten-penny nail burglars are at it again. <laughs> Well, we ran and ran, and we finally wound up, all four of us, me and Schwartz and Flick and Bruner, under a totally strange house under their front porch, laying in the sand, sweating. I couldn't breathe. Bruner was laying flat out on the ground crying, and, and Flick was trying to dig a hole to hide in it, and we could see the squad car going past us once in a while. These guys looking out. See, they knew we were somewhere in that area. They just drift on past, and they had their, they had their red lights off, and they were just drifting by. We laid there. And we laid there. Scared out of our bird. Till about 9 o'clock. I mean really scared. And now this is way past supper time. You know, we were supposed to be home for supper, a whole bit. 
And we finally decided we better we get better get to the hell out because we could hear people walking on the porch above us. These strange people. We crawled out under the hedge. It was dark and cold, and we snuck back down through alleys, through garages, past paint signs and under bushes, and trees, and finally got back over to Flick's house. We went up the back porch and into Flick's kitchen. And Flick's mother was in there. She said, say, she said, Did, are the police still out there? She had no idea what was going on. Flick said, what do you mean, police? She said, well, there were a lot of police over in this vacant lot over here next to us. And they were taking some stuff out of the weeds there. Wonder what all that was about. Are they still out there? Flick said, no, no, they're not out there. We didn't see them. Somebody had discovered our cache of stuff. And they had laid a trap for us. Well, for about ten days, every day at school, we were afraid that the bell would ring. and Somebody would come down and call us. You know, the phone ring in the homeroom there. Come on down. That's the way they pick kids up. <laughs> the police would come to the school. Well, that spring was one of the most, I might say, educational springs of my entire career. From that day on, just never any suggestion of the illicit. Never any suggestion, although there was always the temptation. I can remember laying there on that flat ground under that porch. <laughs> and hearing Bruner in the dark behind his court. <laughs> and seeing that black and white drift on past quietly like a ghost from the netherworld, searching out evil, searching out crime where it might be. But, uh, you know, when uh, when you're on the subject of crime, uh, you want to hear the, the, uh, the aftermath of that thing? Well, there was an aftermath. <laughs> there really was an aftermath because uh, we, we, uh, we, we apparently got away with it. It was ten days and not a word, nothing, nothing. We were not called in at all. And then came the day when we went down to school. It was about on a Wednesday. And you know how they have a bulletin board in the main hall of the school, usually next to the office? Well, there was a bulletin board. We had a bulletin board. Usually things like it would say, uh, Biology Club meets Friday at 3.30, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, there will be a meeting of the swimming team this afternoon, that kind of jazz. Uh, all students wishing to participate in... Uh, etc. Well, there was a bulletin that read the following. Any student who has information regarding the stolen materials from the 1700 block of Kennedy Avenue, please report to the office. There will be a reward for material and for information. You know, they're offering a reward. Well, we, we, you know, we didn't take that much, but apparently, uh, you know, apparently uh, something happened. I don't know what it is. They were really after us. And so that afternoon, I came out of the school, and there was Schwartz walking along and Flick, and Flick says to me, he said, did you see the thing on the bulletin board? Schwartz says, yeah, a reward. He said, do you know how much they're giving? And Flick says, I don't know. He says, well, I heard somebody talking about it in the office. A $100 reward. At which point, Bruner, who was being very quiet, Bruner says, $100? And Flick says, yeah. What's the matter? Bruner's face is as white as a sheet. He says, I told Stanley Roper. Flick says, you did what? So I told Stanley. You told Stanley Roper that we were the guys doing that stuff. Brother says, yeah. Flick says, why did you tell him? He says, I don't know. At which point, Schwartz pops out. I told Jack Martin. Flick and I were the only two who had not told anybody. There we were, me. Flick, saddled with two Raskolnikovs. <laughs> well, 
I, I, I would like to tell you that we got our comeuppance. We did not. Apparently, Stanley Roper and apparently Jack Martin, neither one of them, had much to... But incidentally, they were also both very afraid of the uh, office themselves for their own reasons. <laughs> Never went in to claim the $100 reward. But there are nights, even now, when I wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and I can smell fresh two-by-fours. I could smell the smell of a fresh keg of ten penny nails. And I can hear the sound of distant carpenter hammers rising and falling. And I could smell that faint whiff of asphalt shingles. And my throat clutches and tightens. And my breath comes in short pants from running seventeen miles at full speed. Crime, friends. New York.